nothing but rave reviews for your book online. So I'm going to read this little blurb from Barnes and Noble. Over the past two decades, Inga Saffron has served as the premier chronicler of the city's physical transformation as it emerged from a half century of decline. Through her Pulitzer Prize winning columns on architecture and urbanism in the Philadelphia Inquirer, she has tracked the city's revival on a weekly basis. Becoming Philadelphia collects the best of Saffron's work, plus a new introduction reflecting on the stunning changes the city has undergone. A fearless crusader who is also a seasoned reporter, Saffron ranges beyond the usual boundaries of architectural criticism to explore how big money and politics intersect with design, profoundly shaping our everyday experience of city life. Even as she celebrates Philadelphia's resurgence, she considers how it finds itself grappling with the RUP of success, gentrification, poverty, privatization, and the unequal distribution of public services. What emerges in these 80 pieces in the book is a remarkable narrative of a remarkable time. The proverbial first draft of history, these columns tell the story of how a great city shape-shifted before our very eyes. Inga, welcome. It's so wonderful to have you tonight. I want to tell you that I'm sure that many of us like me here follow your columns religiously. When a building goes up in Philadelphia, the first thing we do is see what does Inga say. Uh, your columns are always well-written, engaging, and sometimes provocative. They're a sheer joy to read. Inga, welcome. I'm going to turn the meeting over to you now. Oh, thank, thank you so much for that really nice introduction, Bob. And, 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 and thank you, um, everyone, for inviting me um, into your Zoom space. Um, and I can imagine this has been a, a very difficult uh, few months for everyone in this group um, <laughs> because of, 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 obviously, because of COVID and um, because this, you know, the streets are nearly empty of, of tourists. So, um, you know, I hope everyone, um, you know, I hope everyone is getting through this. Um, and I hope that there are a few tourists who are brave enough to, to venture into the city and who want tours. Um, the pandemic has, uh, of course, completely altered uh, the way we inhabit Philadelphia and relate to its buildings, streets, and parks. And the anti-racism protests of the last uh, month or two months have further reconfigured our relationship with our surroundings, forcing us to confront the structural inequities that underpin every aspect of the buildings that surround us. The world will never be the same. And unfortunately, all this makes my new book, Becoming Philadelphia, feel a bit like a relic from a bygone era. I knew, of course, when I submitted the manuscript to my editor 18 months ago, that we would have moved on to new concerns by the time it appeared between two covers. That's how it is with, with printed things these days. The Twitterverse and the 24-hour news cycle churns through the news and ideas so fast that it's, it's impossible for books to keep up. I just could never have imagined how different things would be. But what's happened over the past few months has not made becoming Philadelphia any less relevant, just the opposite. I always me meant for the collection to reflect the history of our moment. It turns out it is now the history of our past. And we need to understand the past to make sense of the present. So let me take a step back um, and tell you how this book came, came to be. Two very long years ago, I was approached by a guy named Micah Clight, who is the editor of Rutgers University Press, uh, a native Philadelphian and a longtime reader. Uh, he suggested that I should collect the best of my columns for a book. And I have to admit, I was a little dubious uh, because journalism is not merely uh, the first draft of history. It's the draft you often want to toss in the trash and forget. 
And my columns are typically pegged to some news event, uh, either something that's about to happen or something that has just happened. Uh, their shelf life is short. Uh, so I wondered, you know, would anyone want to read about something that some, anyone want to read something I wrote in 2001 to read it in, two, two, in 2020? Uh, when I was in college, at working on my college newspaper, we, we were all very cynical uh, about newspapers and we wore t-shirts that declared tomorrow's fish wrap today. Uh, nevertheless, I was not about to turn down a book offer. Uh, so that's, that's how it came to be. Um, I wrote my first column in 1999. Uh, that was a few months after I moved back to Philadelphia to become the Inquirer's architecture critic. Uh, I had been living uh, in Moscow where, where I was uh, the Inquirer's Moscow correspondent. Um, and uh, I spent four years there. So it was quite an abrupt turn for me career-wise. Um, in fact, I had spent most of the 90s overseas um, before I, I became the Mor Moscow correspondent, I had uh, been in Yugoslavia, where, where I, I covered the, the breakup of, of that country and the war that followed. Um, I know it's hard to imagine in 2020 that the Inquirer once had uh, an entire staff of foreign correspondents. Um, I was the last Moscow correspondent. Um, and during my years abroad, uh, I, I, as I said, I covered two wars. I, I witnessed the destruction of, of two great multicultural cities, uh, Sarajevo in, in Bosnia and Grozny in Chechnya. And it was very painful to watch these agglomerations of history and human accomplishment reduced to rubble. The experience left me with a deep desire to write about how we treat our own I felt that the Inquirer's coverage specifically and newspaper coverage generally had focused too heavily on the business side of real estate development and not enough on planning and design or how government decisions shape neighborhoods. And having watched Philadelphia and other cities do a lot of damage to themselves with highways, parking, demolitions of historic buildings and bad design, I was eager to shine a light on how decisions about the city's form were made. Okay, so now I'm trying to advance this. Okay, well, I forgot this one, but we'll move on to this one. Um, this is the uh, former Ridge uh, Avenue Farmers Market. Um, and uh, this, this, this photo was taken by a really great photographer, Vince Feldman. Um, and even though this, this farmer's market on Ridge Avenue was a national historic landmark, uh, the highest federal designation, um, this handsome Victorian building by Davis Suckley was casually raised in 1997. There was no debate at that time about its design merits or what the building meant for North Philadelphia or what the city could do with the vacant lot after it was torn down. Uh, gentrification ultimately caught up with the neighborhood and a small apartment building was, uh, was under construction there the last time I went by this site. But I think what, what an asset a food market would have been for the neighborhood and what a, what a fantastic building and what a loss for the city uh, that it is not there. Um, I mentioned this building because um, the outline of this story could be the basis for any number of my columns over the last 20 years. Uh, my, week, my weekly column took its current form about a year after I returned from Russia, when it was christened Changing Skyline. And up until the start of this pandemic, uh, it had appeared every Friday in whatever the Inquirer happened to call its feature section. That's why you can never try to reach me on a Tuesday or Wednesday, because that's when I'm, I'm writing and, and, and taking pictures and putting it all together. And uh, I usually file on Wednesdays. And then come Thursday morning, um, I begin this cycle all over again, calling sources, going to meetings, researching history, and collecting photographs. Anyway, once I had agreed to do this collection, um, I decided to read through all my old columns, and there were more than 1,600 of them. Figuring out which ones to choose wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. 
Obviously, I wanted to include the best written ones, but I also wanted those columns, this book, to tell a larger story. So I made like a little short list um, of three or 400 columns. Um, and then I, I, I printed them out and I started putting them in, in different piles and then I moved the piles around um, and I took some out and I put some back. Um, and as I grouped them together, uh, themes started to emerge. Um, I got rid of some of the, the lesser columns and it, it dawned on me that my 20 years as the architecture critic had coincided with a period of very profound change in Philadelphia. For decades, the city had been losing population, losing jobs, losing tax revenue, losing relevance and political power. And then everything uh, began to turn around. Um, my 1600 columns represent a timeline of Philadelphia's transformation, a spotty one full of gaps, uh, but a timeline nonetheless. Uh, it unfortunately would have been impossible to include every piece. So um, at the end, I finally got them down to 80 columns. And I think of it as a book of snapshots. Uh, the organization of the collection isn't strictly chronological and, and not every major event or building is represented. But my hope is that this book will help people understand that Philadelphia's current boom, which has produced uh, large townhouses like these, um, uh, is a recent and still fragile phenomenon. So for reasons that we're only just beginning to understand, um, Philadelphia began to put itself back together in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Gradually, the exodus of, of residents stopped and the city began to build again. For people who've only recently settled in Philadelphia, the last decade may feel like this nonstop party of, of restaurant openings and festivals, new parks, cult construction and cultural expansion. And this has indeed been the longest, most sustained period of city building in Philadelphia since the early 20th century, when immigrants and black Southerners poured in to work in the city's factories. These new buildings and parks, uh, like this one, in, uh, this park in, in the Hawthorne neighborhood on the edge of Center City, have transformed Philadelphia in wonderful ways. And I know that vibrant is a much abused word, but um, just during this pandemic, it's been really astonishing to watch people out on the streets, picnicking in parks like this, walking their dogs, biking, jogging, and it's not just affluent places um, that have benefited from these improvements. Um, neighborhoods that were completely dependent on overpriced corner stores have seen the arrival of modern supermarkets. New public schools have been built throughout the city. At the same time, we know that the improvements have been starkly unequal. The changes that have made Philadelphia successful and li livable for its middle class have also made life more fraught and uncertain for its low income residents. So how do we assess what happened in Philadelphia during these last two decades? Is it a success story or a tragedy or maybe a bit of both? I don't think you can properly answer that question without fully understanding what the city was like before the boom. So I want to take you back again to 1999. That was the year that the city finally tore down one Meridian Plaza, a 70s era office building on the south side of City Hall. The tower had been destroyed eight years earlier in a fire that completely gutted the upper floors. At the time, it was the worst high rise fire in America. Three firefighters lost their lives trying to put out this blaze which also ruined a block of Chestnut Street and seriously damaged the, the beautiful marble Girard Trust building. A few months after the fire, I left Philadelphia to cover the war in Yugoslavia. And over the course of the 90s, I would return to the city briefly. I had a baby, I went overseas again, this time to Moscow. All the while, 
While I was away, the burned out hulk of the Meridian stood there untouched, glaring down on City Hall, a symbol of Philadelphia's decline. When I returned from my posting in Moscow seven years later, at the end of 1998, the charred empty tower was still there. It wasn't until the following year that its owners finally began demolition. Around the same time, there were other stirrings of change. 1999 was the year that the first version of the 10-year tax abatement was introduced. Now, coincidentally, it was also the year that the city began to implode the MLK Towers, the dilapidated and much reviled public housing project at 12th and, and Catherine. And that's where I showed you a few minutes ago, uh, Hawthorne Park. Um, that's just 10 minutes from City Hall. Um, over the, uh, the next two decades, two dozen public housing towers would be yanked from the skyline like rotten teeth and the neighborhoods rebuilt at lower densities. So I'm not gonna argue that those brutal soul crushing towers should have been saved. Yet I do think it's worth noting that the city began removing those enclaves of poverty at the exact same moment it was shifting its resources into middle-class housing through the abatement. Both decisions got us to where we are today. I also don't want to imply that 1999 was a specific turning point. As I say in my introduction of, to my book, history doesn't move in a straight line, it lurches. But it is possible, I think, to see the late 90s as an inflection point much as 2020 is likely to end up as one as well. So just as it's difficult to pinpoint the moment of Philadelphia's turnaround, it's also hard to identify the moment of its decline. In the first decades of the 20th century, I'm sure you all know, Philadelphia proudly called itself the workshop of the world. Midvale Steel turned out the raw material for the nation's industrial turbines. The Bud Company assembled train cars and automobiles, and workers at the Navy Yard fashioned steel plates into mighty ships. The city had tens of thousands of good paying working class jobs, a vibrant downtown, and renowned cultural institutions. The city continued to grow into the 1950s um, and to, sa to satisfy the demand for modern housing, developers plowed through the farms to create new neighborhoods of the great Northeast. And yet there were indications that all was not well. Even while the city was expanding at the edges, the neighborhoods in the center, like this one in, in the Tioga section, were beginning their, their slow, painful slide. Suburbanization would take the city's residence and deindustrialization would take its jobs. Once a city of 2.2 million, Philadelphia had shriveled to less than 1.5 million by the 90s. A lot of people think of the 60s as the worst decade for Philadelphia, but it was really the 70s when the city hit bottom, hemorrhaging 140,000 jobs and 13% of its population during that decade of the 70s. Only the cities of Baltimore and Detroit lost a greater percentage of their residents. Midvale Steel closed in 1976, the year Philadelphia celebrated the nation's bicentennial. Bud was subsumed into an international conglomerate in 1978. Dozens and dozens of small manufacturers went under and factories closed and people lost their jobs. As I said, though, history doesn't move in a straight line, it lurches. And even as the city shed all those industrial jobs, Philadelphia saw the rise of a gleaming office district along West Market Street in the 1980s. The first Liberty Place Tower was completed in 1987, breaking the city's height limit and becoming the city's tallest building. But the late 80s were also the beginning of the crack, crack epidemic which would decimate struggling neighborhoods that were already reeling from the loss of factory jobs. Most people expected the city's population to keep shrinking. Today, we worry about managing gentrification. But when I returned to Philadelphia in 1999 and started writing about architecture, 
the talk was entirely about managing decline. I frequently heard policymakers question whether it was worth the effort to keep Philadelphia intact as a city. It was very popular at, at that time to argue that Philadelphia needed to de-densify if it wanted to survive, that it had become more like the suburbs, that it had to tear down its old obsolete buildings and remake itself. So uh, a guy named Andres Duani, who was a very famous new urbanist planner, gave a lecture at the Foundation for Architecture uh, the year I came back. And he argued uh, that we should designate A streets and B streets. A streets were worth saving and B streets should be leveled. One of the B streets in his view was Sansom Street. Uh, this desire to build Philadelphia in a less dense suburban model was also one of the underlying assumptions of Mayor John Street's signature program, the Neighborhood Transformation Initiative. Uh, and you can see the results of that initiative in, in this image. The idea was to replace blocks of tightly packed row houses with freestanding homes, complete with lawns and driveways. This, is a, this picture is at 13th and Poplar, uh, which as you can, you can see how close it is uh, to Center City. Um, it's really walkable. Um, I think it's uh, four stops on the Broad Street subway. Um, it's a suburb in the city. Um, and imagine if this had become the template for all new development. Uh, fortunately, it didn't. Uh, so what happened instead? Uh, as I said, when I returned uh, in 99, Ed Rendell was still mayor. Um, and uh, he deserves a lot of credit. In the mid-90s, uh, he had managed almost by force of will to keep the city from going bankrupt. Um, uh, that bankruptcy was precipitated by the dramatic decline in tax revenues as factories closed and companies left the city. To survive, Rendell knew that Philadelphia needed to replace its lost manufacturing jobs, and he believed that the hospitality industry could provide them. So he embarked on a suite of, of, of mega projects um, aimed at luring tourists into the city. Um, and um, the battle cry uh, in, in those days uh, was um, to uh, end Philadelphia's reputation as an afternoon stop uh, between Washington and New York and get people to stay overnight. Um, we have become so used to the slow creep of incremental low budget public improvements in the last uh, couple of mayoral administrations uh, that it's worth recalling the scale of uh, Rendell, Rendell's ambitions, um, not just the scale of his ambitions, but some of the, the uh, failures, I guess. So convinced that casino gambling would generate a share of revenue, Rendell put forward a plan to transform the Delaware waterfront into a Vegas style shopping mall bracketed by two sprawling casino com complexes. The Philadelphia side would be linked to attractions in Camden by a soaring tram. Uh, we have never had a full accounting, but at least $20 million was put into this effort before the tram was abandoned. Uh, and this big concrete pier, which you see here, which was supposed to support the tram, is now uh, in the process of being torn down. It, it may already be gone. Um, so it wasn't just the waterfront that, that uh, Rendell had these really big plans for. Um, he, uh, he envisioned the creation of Philadelphia's own Great White Way on, on, on South Broad Street, lined with theaters and concert, hall, concert halls. In South Philadelphia, uh, he, met, he, he envisioned expanding the, the sports complex with new stadiums for, for baseball and football. The empty expanses, expanse of Independence Mall would be filled in with history museums. Rendell was a master salesman um, and a great cheerleader for the city. And his vision for a renewed Philadelphia really excited a lot of people. Um, 
And Philadelphia was by no means the only city to bet its future on tourist attractions and mega projects. Uh, many American cities watched enviously as Baltimore rejuvenated its inner harbor with Camden Yards and a new aquarium. By the late 90s, cities all over the world were in the throes of the Bilbao effect. That Basque city in northern Spain had become a major tourist attraction after the, re after the opening of Frank Gehry's Guggenheim Museum in 1997. Every big American city wanted its own Camden Yards and its own Frank Gehry building. Philadelphia did end up getting a modern concert hall, some history museums, two new sports stadiums, and of course the barns. And now hospitality, as I'm sure you are all aware, is our sec second biggest industry, uh, employing 77,000 people, uh, at least before the pandemic. Um, and it's great that we have it. Um, but there were several problems um, with pouring all this money into mega projects, um, besides the fact that some of them didn't work out. Um, those, those projects were largely focused on fixing up the city for people who didn't live here. And because these attractions were geared to suburbanites and tourists, they often required huge amounts of parking. They, they required money that Philadelphia didn't have and had to borrow, and, and that caused the city to outsource planning and design decisions to developers and private companies. As Philadelphia began to rebuild in the early 2000s, parking garages proliferated, just as highways had a generation earlier. Only a single casino that uh, Rendell envisioned ended up getting built on the waterfront. And it's, it's, it's basically the size of a Target store. Um, yet the adjacent parking garage uh, for 3,000 for, uh, 3, cars uh, is, is, is several times bigger than the casino itself. And, and there's a massive, massive surf, surface parking lot all on the beautiful Delaware waterfront. Um, so in my first year, years as architecture critic, I found myself increasingly writing about parking proposals, uh, partly because there were virtually no new buildings to write about, um, and because I really felt that um, uh, there was too much of an emphasis on, on making Philadelphia conform to a, a suburban model. Um, Taking his cues from Andres Duani, the new urbanist pl planner I had mentioned, one of Rendell's cronies came up with a plan to demo demolish an entire block of Sansom Street to build 12, a 12 story parking garage. Meanwhile, Rend Rendell enlisted another developer to build a parking garage across from Rittenhouse Square on the site where uh, a new condo building called the Laurel uh, is now rising right now today. Um, Fortunately, both those proposals um, eventually died. Uh, the parking garage on Sansom Street is now an apartment building, and the one that was planned for Rittenhouse Square, you can see, is, is also going to be a, a large, a large apartment building. But um, all, all sorts of um, developers and institutions were just just on a tear to build parking garages. Jefferson Hospital demolished an entire block of 19th century commercial buildings on Sansom Street for a massive parking deck, um, which, which actually fronts onto Chestnut Street. And it has uh, a row of ground floor retail spaces that are sadly empty. Um, in the Fairmount neighborhood, Rendell gave away an entire city block for surface parking lot and that remains there to this day. The city spent $50 million to build a parking garage next to 30th Street Station, mainly to serve affluent suburban commuters. Uh, it spent all that money, but uh, it has yet to muster uh, the funds or energy to reopen the underground passage that connects um, 30th Street Station to the Market Frankfurt L. Uh, a transit system used by city residents. Anyway, 
it was hardly my goal to to be the reviewer of parking garages uh, or or to focus on these things. I I had envisioned being uh, writing very nice aesthetic pieces about new buildings and and critiquing them. But um, I I felt that uh, city planners had their priorities backwards and. Um, this obsession with remaking the city to, you know, uh, on a suburban model, I just felt was a, a terrible mistake. And um, so many buildings continued to be, uh, that were occupied by people, uh, were torn down or replaced with, with buildings that were, um, you know, largely intended for cars. Uh, I, I felt that would make the city less successful. I also couldn't help noticing in those early years that many of the developers who were uh, getting these zoning approvals and demolishing historic buildings and building parking garages uh, were some of the most generous campaign donors in the city. So it became increasingly difficult for me to write about design without also writing about politics and policy. Um, and. Uh, I think I got a little bit of a reputation uh, as being anti-developer. I, I will. I don't think of myself that way, but um, because cities have always been built by private people and companies risking their own money. Uh, but because buildings exist in a public context, I always believe that even quotidian projects like apartment buildings uh, are fair game for review. Um, I, this is um, Symphony House, and uh, I reviewed that building when it opened in 2007. Some people felt I was um, a little too negative in my critique of, of it. Um, and um, the headline, uh, which um, is a little bit notorious, was Nightmare on Broad Street. Um, and um, the developer was massively upset and um, there were lots of letters to the editor and um, rebuttals. Um, but as much as I was critical of Symphony House's design, um, you know, the poor materials, the, the cavernous maw of the, of, of the garage entrance on Broad Street, there was actually one good thing you could say about this building. And um, Symphony House signaled a departure from the mega projects that um, the city had been championing, championing and subsidizing. So that tower uh, was the beginning of a wave of residential construction that has really, you know, gone on almost without stop for more than a decade, um, fueled by the tax abatement, which gave the buyers of, of, of new and renovated homes a significant break on their property taxes for 10 years. Uh, more than 15,000 new homes and apartments have been built since 2000. And many, many more have been renovated. Uh, there is little doubt that the abatement helped offset the, the city's raw edges and convince people who might have otherwise settled in the suburbs to cast their lot with the city. While the tax abatement doesn't deserve all the credit, it did play a role in reversing the city's population decline. Um, the growth has been slow in comparison with Sunbelt cities um, and places like DC and San Francisco, but since 2010, Philadelphia has added 100,000 new residents, an increase of 4.3%. Many of the newcomers are immigrants um, and millennials and Gen Z. Um, they've all come in sizable numbers, and I think what's attracted them have been the human scale neighborhoods, the mix of old and new, its walkable streets, and transit options. Um, and uh, there's little doubt that the population growth in neighborhoods like Northern Liberties and Queen Village caused City Hall uh, and the mayors that followed Rendell to rethink um, their planning priorities. The Dunner administration, um, with the encouragement of the William Penn Foundation, was the first to recognize that rebuilding neighborhoods was the key to the city's future. Um, his administration was really a golden age of park building in Philadelphia. Um, this is um, Penn Treaty Park, which has just been very nicely uh, 
connected to the trail that ironically runs behind the Sugar House Casino. I guess I should call it the Rivers Casino. That's the, the new name for it. Um, during the Nutter administration, the focus on the Delaware finally shifted away from mega projects to parks like this and trails. Uh, on, on the other side, uh, the Schuylkill River Trail was extended. Uh, I know it's popular to say that Center City and other affluent neighborhoods were the primary beneficiary of public investment, but the city was also turning its at attention to so-called middle neighborhoods, ones that hadn't been touched by the um, During the Nutter administration, the city finally started to deal with decades of deferred maintenance uh, in its libraries and schools. Um, and it, as I said, it, it built uh, parks, uh, branch libraries like, like, like the neoclassical Marrero branch on Lehigh Avenue uh, was renovated and given a new addition. Um, supermarkets were subsidized in, in, in food deserts. Um, uh, the city built hundreds of, of units of affordable housing in North Philadelphia. Um, most Philadelphia's poor neighborhoods still cry out for basic improvements, particularly parks, rec centers, and housing. Uh, it would not be really fair to the committed city officials to say that those neighborhoods have been completely overlooked. Um, this mixed income housing uh, next to Temple University, the Temple University uh, Regional Rail Stop, uh, shows what the city can do when uh, it puts its mind to improving housing options. Uh, this building is a mix of market rate and uh, subsidized units. It has a health clinic, a bank. Uh, it's really a model project. Um, yeah, you know, despite these improvements, these new, new and uh, newly built amenities and uh, renovations of existing amenities. Um, there's no doubt that the city has become more unequal um, as a result of this building boom. The more that certain neighborhoods improved, the more they became unaffordable to the people who live there. Take Fishtown and the neighborhood we're now calling Old Richmond. In 2000, 45% of the apartments were easily affordable by minimum wage workers in Old Richmond. Today, it's less than 7%. Despite the vast makeover of the city's midsection, despite the rise of the Comcast Tower and the birth of a second downtown in University City, almost a quarter of Philadelphia's residents live in poverty, more than in any of America's 10 largest cities. Gentrification has, has made historic black neighborhoods like Graduate Hospital unrecognizable. Um, even worse in my book, uh, even worse than gentrification, it, I would argue, is uh, dormification that we're seeing in uh, North Philadelphia and Mantua near Temple and Drexel. Because there's never enough money to go around, the city has been all too eager to outsource many of its responsibilities to private managers, everything from charter schools to Dilworth Park, further increasing the gulf between the haves and the have-nots. This is not just a Philadelphia problem, it's a national problem, and we won't solve it on our own. I've talked a lot about what Philadelphia has accomplished during the boom times, um, but it's also important to look at the opportunities that we squandered. Uh, we haven't built a rapid transit line on Roosevelt Boulevard, something we've been talking about since the 60s. It would connect residents from the sprawling Northeast to jobs in Center City. For that matter, we haven't built any new transportation infrastructure apart from bike lanes and um, a couple of uh, improved transit stops. Uh, people who can't afford to take Amtrak to New York and Washington must still stand outside in the blazing sun and freeze, freezing cold to catch the, the Bolt and mega buses. We also continue to squander our greatest patrimony, our historic buildings like the Boyd, Boyd Theater, uh, and this is Jewelers Row, and this is the Boyd Theater, um, 
but I, I will say there have been some amazing saves. And actually in this image, uh, the Boyd is on the upper left and um, the Met Opera House, which uh, I never thought I would see uh, renovated in my lifetime, um, was completely uh, restored and uh, was uh, thriving as a Live Nation concert hall uh, before the pandemic. Given the Philadelphia's struggle with poverty and racism, some might say the city doesn't have the luxury to bother with design issues or historic preservation. I like to think that my column uh, deals with issues both macro and micro that are meaningful to the whole city, individual neighborhoods. I also believe that urban form is crucial to creating a more equitable world. Parking lots don't just make nice neighborhoods less walkable. They encourage people to drive, accelerating climate change, which we know will hit the poor the hardest. We will never be able to support good transit systems or build enough affordable housing if we insist that every house and apartment come with its own parking spot. And the struggles around these issues are only going to become more fraught as a result of the pandemic. Um, of course, there's been a huge amount of speculation about what's going to happen uh, to cities uh, as a result uh, of, of COVID. Um, I personally don't believe for a minute that um, cities are going to wither away. Um, there's a great human desire to be among, among people, to walk down the street and see people you know, to, to visit a park, uh, to meet friends. In a way, I think it's sort of been the most heartening take, take away from the pandemic, um, just seeing how full our parks have been um, when, when you know, everything else was closed. But of course, there will be enormous challenges um, in the next few years. There are going to be fewer people working on, uh, in the big office towers on Market Street, and that and because many of them do come from the suburbs, um, the city will collect less wage tax. Um, if there are fewer workers, there's going to be fewer restaurants, lunch places. Um, that's less revenue for the city. Um, that decline in revenue um, will make it harder for the city to provide uh, basic services. Um, and uh, some people are going to leave over that. Um, we're seeing how impatient people have been over the um, um, delayed trash collection in the last few weeks. Um, if the city has less less revenue coming in, it could become more dependent on private interests, on you know the whims of developers and and other entities. Um, but please, I hope I hope you won't ask me uh, to predict the future because I I don't know better than anybody else what's going to happen. Um, I do hope, you know, if you look at my book, um, you'll see that it um, provides a, a window on the recent past. And I hope that will be instructive about uh, in, in how we think about the future. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Um, and uh, I think if there are questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you very much. So uh, we do have some questions for you. Let me just go, go up here. Um, first from Bob. Um, he says, it's easy to learn from the successes, but what lessons can we learn from the failures? Well, um, you know, we have a lot of really, uh, we, have, we have quite a few, um, badly designed buildings. Um, so during that period of the early 2000s when the city was really, you know, sort of pinning its future survival on suburbanites and, and, and tourists, it, it, um, and when it was convinced that everything needed to have tons of parking, uh, you know, quite a few buildings were designed with very massive garage bases, very little active uses on the ground floor. Um, uh, you know, 
certainly from an earlier period, there's a building on Locust Street, I think it's called, I want to say 1600, um, which is like a big, you know, a tower that sits on a multi-story garage. Um, you know, a lot of those uh, buildings with blank walls are, um, are very off-putting. Um, I will say, you know, uh, while, you know, the architecture of, of a lot of developer buildings has been pretty mediocre um, over the last two decades, a lot of developers have really improved their urbanism and they've taken more efforts. Uh, they've either reduced the amount of parking or they've taken efforts to camouflage the parking. Um, and so sometimes we see pretty mundane uh, building designs that are quite good urbanistically. Um, so that's, that's a reminder. I would say the other one is, um, you know, a lot of the historic buildings that we've lost. And now, very, very sadly, on Jewelers Row, there's a big hole in the ground because after years and years of fighting um, over um, its right to tear tear down uh, five buildings on Jewelers Row, Toll Brothers has paused the construction of um, a condo tower it was planning there. You know, that's a mistake staring us in the face. Um, the, you know, the thing that, the tower that replaced the Boyd Theater um, is really a, an unfortunate design. Um, and 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 the the company that built it, Pearl Properties, um, has has yet to find a tenant to occupy the part of the movie theater that was preserved, which was the very beautiful Art Deco lobby. So it's it's pretty it's pretty sad um, to see that reminder. Mm -hmm. uh, from Rich, we have uh, believing that poor planning. An uninspired architecture should be a felony offense, <laughs> or should be felony offenses. If you were a judge, who would you want to prosecute the most? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, uh, well, that's that's hard to say because, you know. Uh, so I, of course, I didn't like Symphony House. I, I hated the materials. I hated the sort of uh, faux traditional design. But Carl Dranoff, the developer, you know, has learned a few things. He, he built a building on the Schuylkill River that's uh, designed by Cecil Baker, that's more modern, that's pretty respectable. Um, he hired a really good architect for this building he's building on uh, across from uh, the Kimmel. Uh, so we can't, I don't think, I don't know if we can like convict him. Maybe <laughs> just get a couple years in jail. Um, you know, and then, you know, Bart Blatstein is kind of notorious for proposing this just like uh, cheapo, you know, um, suburban style projects. He fought uh, tooth and nail to, to build a, a Wawa um, super gas station on the waterfront, even though it was clearly outlawed um, in the waterfront master plan. Um, thankfully, that was just rejected by the zoning board, by the way. But, um, you know, Bart Blastin is the guy that built um, the Sch Schmitz project at a time when nobody was building anything like that. He had to be dragged kicking and screaming that that site he originally envis envisioned it uh as kind of a strip mall mm -hmm. uh, but um but a lot of people in northern liberties fought with him until he agreed to build housing and i i still think that's a a, a very fine work of architecture um and it's just been renovated um by a much better owner uh, the Post Brothers. Um, so, you know, maybe Bart gets a few years in jail too. <laughs> um, then there are the enabler firms. Can, can you stop screen sharing so we can see you better? Oh yeah, let me let me see how to do that. 
New share. No. Not that. Oh, stop share. Yeah. <laughs> All right. How's that? Great. Okay. Yep. Okay, let's go. Um, Rick has a question, which I think is a really great question. Um, in your opinion, how would Philadelphia today be different if we never had the 10 year tax abatement for new construction and rehabilitation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that is a very good question. Um, so um, you may have seen a story I wrote this week um, saying that, you know, there's this last minute scramble to uh, qualify for the abatement. And just this month alone, um, 3,600 apartments are proposed. And I know there's going to be um, a couple thousand more next month, you know, as, as the end of the year approaches. Um, and, and the abatement, um, this version of the abatement will end and a, a new version that's only um, it's the equivalent of five years will come into effect. So it's basically half as valuable. So since I wrote that story, people have, you know, some people have been up in arms, you know, why should these developers get this benefit? Um, you know, that money should go to the school district. I, I, I agree. And I, 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 I lobbied to, you know, I, I wrote a couple of columns um, saying we should, should, you know, uh, reform the abatement. But I will say, um, and I think some people don't fully appreciate this, when, when the abatement was introduced um, in 1999, and it's, um, it was a sort of a modest, uh, a limited version, and then I think in 2000, um, the current version came into, into effect. I mean, it was really, really necessary. And that incentive really inspired developers to take this risk. And um, in, it, in its original form of the abatement, um, it was just for the conversion of um, these mothballed class B offices in uh, mostly in Center City and, and some factories in, into apartments. Uh, and it was incredible because this, you know, Center City, um, when, when um, all the new towers all went up in the uh, 80s and 90s along West Market Street, they became what's called Class A, which is the most desirable office towers. And they rendered all the older office buildings Class B or Class C. Uh, and a lot of those were gorgeous, uh, you know, early 20th century buildings, and they were completely mothballed, and nobody knew what to do with them. And so in the original version of the tax abatement, um, you got this amazing tax break for turning them to, into apartments and they were perfect for that. Uh, and suddenly, you know, there were hundreds more people in Center City and I'm sure lots of you remember when, you know, the sidewalks would fold up after five o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, so all of a sudden, there, are many, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there are many more people living downtown and, you know, restaurants to open to cater to them and stores. And then when the abatement got expanded, you know, we saw tremendous amounts of uh, row house construction and then apartment const new apartment construction. So I, I, I think the abatement has played a tremendous role in transforming the city. You know, I'm a bit critical of the mega projects because I think a lot of money was wasted and we got, you know, not so great results. But um, I think the abatement really produced results. You know, the reason um, that I wrote these columns calling for it to be revived, revised, and other people, uh, lots of people call for it to be eliminated, was because I think we, you know, this, there was so much construction, you know, you had to ask, you know, is it really necessary to spur construction? And one of the downsides of the abatement is that, you know, the city doesn't get taxes for 10 years. And 55% of property taxes go to the schools. So, you know, there were, there were lots of uh, inequities, you know, um, what's the good of having all these people move into the city if you're not gonna, you know, fund the schools and make them desirable so people stay here and raise their families here. Uh, and then, you know, there was a fairness question, you know, had, you had lots of people moving into houses existing houses that weren't abated and they were paying taxes and the taxes were going up. 
So you had side by side people paying more and more taxes with people paying no taxes. So I, I do think it was right to revise the abatement, uh, but I do I, I, I think you I think you can't underestimate that you know how, how um, significant it was in in helping the city um, come back. Uh, just a couple more questions for you. Um, do you have any thoughts on the Parkway homeless encampment? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it is very painful to see that. Um, and, um, you know, the city, this city, like every city, has, you know, a tremendous, you know, just um, a huge problem finding a way to house um uh people who are who are most vulnerable and um marginal and the fact you know it's really it's really awful to see it and i i know people who live in that in fairmount it just must be so difficult for them to 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 pass that encampment and you know uh, to see the 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 conditions that people are living in and 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 you know of course there's trash and other things um but you know the fact that it's in our face and it's really, it's re, you know it's really forcing us to confront this problem. Um, so I'm, you know, I know it's really I know I know people in the city um, departments that are trying to deal with this are really committed um, to a solution. But um, you know I think it's important to keep this pressure on. Uh, so that we can really deal with it. If they weren't all there massed on the parkway, they, you know, the, and, and people were still homeless, um, they would be all, I mean, they're still all over the city. It's, it's a huge problem. It's a huge, huge problem with no easy answers. Um, uh, but, um, you know, we haven't been very effective at, at creating affordable housing for, for people at the bottom. Um, um, how, how about thoughts on the uh, one percent for public art? Some of it we love, some of it we don't love. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's always going to be the case. You can't, you know, have a home run every time. Um, my concern is that um, in the cases where it's required, developers try to wiggle out of it so often. I mean, we hardly hold them to that. Um, there's less and less public art and what it what public art there is is not you know we're not demanding it um we're not demanding enough that has been going on for a long time i mean the 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 um abramovich piece in front of uh dockside was supposed to be much larger and the developer cheaped out on it uh, that's the the flying fish um I, you know, there's a, a 1% um, piece on um, the completed portion of the rail park, the viaduct, uh, which you, it, I think it's supposed to be like a sculpture of a, a telephone tower with birds on it, but it looks like a telephone tower. <laughs> uh, so that's a pretty unfortunate piece. Um, and of course, Dilworth Park was supposed to have um, public art, which they had for about five minutes. Um, it was a great idea um, to have this, this mist come, you know, coming up through the surface of the park, uh, following the path of the trains under, underground. Um, and the Center City District turned it on for a couple weeks, weeks, I think, and then shut it off and we haven't seen it since. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, you know, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes things fail. Sometimes art does, isn't successful. Yeah. We can understand that, but I, I, I'm more concerned about uh, developers and, and others um, avoiding their obligations. Mm -hmm. uh, just two questions left. Um, this one is very near and dear to all our hearts. Uh, what measures would you recommend to strengthen our preservation laws? Uh, well, you, you may know that um, 
under the Kenny administration, uh, the city uh, went through a big, long, you know, citizen uh, study process to come up with um, better ways uh, to promote preservation and, and serve preservation. And, it, you know, the results were kind of disappointing. There were, there were a few victories. Um, there's now actually a bigger tax abatement uh, for people who reno renovate older homes. That was a, a really big victory. But um, I know the Preservation Alliance and others were advocating for this thing called demolition delay, which um, would have prevented you know, developers from tearing down um, uh, potentially historic buildings. What I mean, I, buildings that were that could have could qualify for designation, uh, but hadn't been designated. The demolition de delay would have uh, preserved them while they were evaluated. Um, that would have been a big victory. I mean, we. I think there is a reasonable argument to be made that um, you know if we really want people to preserve private you know, private owners to preserve buildings, we have to offer them some kind of compensation. Um, this extended tax abatement is, 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 is a good start. Uh, we probably need some more uh, incentives. Mm. Okay, last question. Okay. Uh, what is the one best thing we could do as a city to make it more livable to its citizens? Uh, <laughs> I would go back to saying t tame tame the cars. I mean, yeah, it. I'm really interested. You know, these streeteries, this outdoor dining, um, has been amazing in the last few weeks, and and the fact that we were suddenly able to give up parking spaces for these outdoor restaurants so that these restaurants could survive, mm -hmm. you know, forced us to take away some excess street space from cars. Uh, we can do more of that, I think, uh, to create parks and bike lanes uh, and just make, you know, widen our sidewalks and make life better for pedestrians. Um, so, um, we, you know, we, we have deferred for too long to the car and, um, that, you know, that would, that would make life more pleasant. I mean, the world is about to, the world is changing <laughs> in a very dramatic way. And um, if there are going to be fewer commuters, um, you know, if, if it's going to be more of a bedroom city, uh, in a sense, um, maybe we, you know, we can really get by with less of that street space. We're certainly going to need more parks. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think that's crucial uh, for the city's survival. More and better parks, um, you know, because uh, if you're working at home, <laughs> you're going to want to get out of your house. And uh, so um, I think uh, amenities, you know, quality amenities are key, as you know, along with all the other things I talked about, like, you know, improving our schools and uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, I totally agree with that. All right. Well, I again, I'd like to thank you. It was a wonderful, wonderful lecture. Um, and I hope we'll all be buying your book. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you all for being there. And uh, I, ho I hope we start to see some tourists come back on the streets. Um, yeah. yeah. So I would ask my group, um, you know, if you want to stay on, we're just going to have a quick meeting. Um, and if you want to raise any concerns, too. So um, enjoy your vacation. Thing. Yes. Thank you Thank so you. much. Nice Thank to you. see you all. Thank you. Okay. So long. Bye bye. Bye. All right, guys. So you can, um, if you want to, uh,